Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our last uh, webinar of today. Uh, we are having our prestigious guest, Dr. Ahmed Farid, a research and development reservoir engineer who will uh, introduce us to core analysis and uh, SCAL. Ahmed Farid Ibrahim is a research and development reservoir engineer. The main focused area is the Gulf of Mexico and the Lower Basin with some exposure to North American unconventional new ventures. He got his PhD from Texas A&M. Ibrahim has more than 10 years of diversified international experience, including working for Apache Corporation North America, Unconventional Resources Region, and Aventec International Company. Ibrahim's area of research include well stimulation and formation damage removal, CO2 sequestration, foam injection, coal bed methane, and reservoir modeling and simulation for conventional and unconventional and unconventional reservoirs. He holds a bachelor and master's degree from Cairo University. Please uh, help me uh, welcome Dr. Uh, Ahmed uh, Farid Ibrahim and uh, we can't uh, wait doctor to hear uh, from you about the core analysis and uh, you sharing your experience with us. Okay, thank you Reem. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good evening, if you are back there in Middle East or here in uh, US. So my presentation today about core analysis. I'm gonna share mostly about the experimental analysis, best practice, like the how to do the experiment. There is some issues with each experiment. How to get the properties for the uh, reservoir course. So my agenda today. I'm gonna start with where we can get this course, like the core source. Then we, the preparation and the cleaning process for the core, porosity measurement, absorption isotherm measurement, permeability measurement, relative permeability, and finally, weightability analysis. So the core source, where we can get our cores. So there is two type, basically, the reservoir cores from the formation, actual formation cores, and outcrop cores. So for the outcrop for the reservoir cores, there is different technique we can use to get the uh, the reservoir cores. So we basically go to the formation and use drill bit and get some cores. So there is two main. Uh, there is two main uh, techniques that we can use to get the course. One is the whole core analysis. And this one here, it's gonna be during uh, the drilling. So we use a special drill bit with like, it's, it's, op it's like a cutter from here and it's open from the middle. And there's a bar barrel in the, uh, above the drill bit. So we go inside the hole and then drill our uh, formation we get, we retain the core inside the barrel here, and then we take it to the surface. So the cores usually it's around seven inch in diameter and 90, inch, uh, 90 feet can go up to 90 feet long. Once we got the uh, core from the, from the uh, barrel here at the surface, we have to uh, coat it with hot wax in order to avoid drying uh, of the fluid inside it. We can do some lithological analysis at the well site, uh, give some description about the mineralogy for uh, the formation. Another technique for it is the, uh, is the uh, side wall coring tool. So in this one here, it's not during the drilling, it's after that, so we are using a work over rig. We uh, go with wire line uh, tool, same as the uh, logging tool. And then we have this tool here. There is different type of this one here. This one here is just to show how we got the uh, sidewall core. So we go with the uh, wire line, and then at a certain depth that was uh, defined previously used by the geologist. So the geologist go and check the uh, wheel logs. And based on the location or the depth that he want to get more information about it, he suggests, yeah, let's get 
core sample at this depth. We want to investigate like the formation proper, formation flow properties. We want to know more about the uh, formation properties like the porosity or the permeability or the wettability of the rock at this point. So we go with the wireline tool and at this depth, we plug our tool. We have here like a gun or a small drill bit. It, it gets a small samples and it contain it here in this uh, reservoir. So it can get up to 20 sample per one run. So you can get different samples from here. Let me get this. You can get sample from different depths. Start here, then move down, or usually start from the down, from down, get a sample from here, then move up, get another sample, then move up, then get another sample. The dimension for the uh, sidewall course, it is a small course, so it's around one inch to two, uh, one to two inch, uh, which is uh, two to five centimeter uh, for the diameter and the, uh, the lens. So the difference between the whole core analysis and the side wall, the whole core provide larger uh, samples, as I said, seven inch in diameter up to, tw uh, up to 20 uh, feet in length. Uh, it is better to get more uh, information about it, uh, the core because like it's a so long, it's, 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 it's cover uh, long uh, depths, long uh, range of uh, the formation. It's better for heterogeneous formation so we can catch if there is a difference in the properties from uh, uh, from uh, depth to another, for the side wall cores, it is a small uh, small samples. It is a chipper, so uh, we don't have to stop the drilling and go with this special drill bit and uh, get the whole core. But it's less representative for heterogeneous formation. And in case of uh, low uh, porosity formation, the porosity estimate from the scores is usually higher than the actual. Due to like why we are drilling, we, the, due, due to the drilling, drilling bed, we, we can induce some fracturing inside the formation and this can change the uh, uh, properties a little bit. This, so this is an example for the, this picture here, show an example for the whole core and the side wall. So this one here, as you can see, as you can see, see this is the core here. This is a seven inch diameter and the lens. And then we go on and drill small cores and this one here, we can use it to measure the horizontal permeability. If we drill the core, this one here, if we drill it in this size, so we use a special drill bit at surface. We drill a core here. Uh, from the whole course. So we can use it to get the horizontal permeability. If we drill the core perpendicular to, uh, parallel to the core lens here, we can get the vertical permeability. For the side wall course, it is a small blocks. If we, will, if we use it for permeability measurement, it's gonna be horizontal permeability. We cannot use it to get the vertical permeability uh, for the formation. The second source for the cores is outcrop cores. Sometimes we are not able to get the, uh, the reservoir cores. Let's say the well is already drilled. Uh, we don't have uh, pime for it. And then later on, we want to do some uh, stimulation job. We want to do some acidizing. We don't have uh, like uh, which uh, fluid is suitable for this formation. So we want to do some uh, experimental analysis on it to, to decide which chemical is good for it or not. So another source is the outcrop cores. So our formation, it can be exposed to the surface after like uh, after, uh, at a certain area. So we can go there as you can see here. So this is a formation, could be our formation in a different uh, area, but here it's exposed to the surface. So we go here and we cut uh, outcrop block and we do analysis for this one here. So this one here, it's gonna have the same uh, metallurgical analysis. It's gonna have uh, almost the same effect uh, due to the depth, but here with the porosity and the permeability will be a little bit higher, slightly higher than the actual due to there is no overburden on it. So this is a, this picture ratio. show, this one of the outcrop cores, it's sandstone. So it's this block here, and then we use a special uh, driller uh, in the lab to cut cores, cylindrical cores, and this course we can use it for uh, investigating different fluid for acidizing or 
uh, all the experimental work that you want. The next uh, step is cleaning and preparation. So once we got the course, we cannot use it directly for uh, properties estimation. We have to clean the score if it has uh, some residue from the uh, reservoir fluid or from uh, formation water. So there is different technique in order to do this. All the technique based on using special solvent like toluene or acetone. And this solvent, we heat, it, heat the core with the solvent at a certain temperature in order to evaporate the water inside the core. And then this solvent will dissolve the organic matter or the oil inside the core and take it out. So one of this method, like so there is a centrifugal force, there is a direct injection of this solvent. Another method here is based on the STM method here is the Dean Stark. And Dean Stark basically we bought, so this picture here for actual Dean Stark, it has different Dean Stark here. And this is a schematic for it. So it has a flux. And then we have we put our core sample here. We put our solvent here, which is a, a toluene. And then we have here a condenser. This condenser can be connected with uh, stream water, cold water. We use to call uh, to cool the any vapor here. So the process done by putting the core here, our solvent. Then we heat the system at 110. Uh, centigrade. So this one here, this will evaporate the wind, it will go up and heat the sample. And due to heat, the water will vaporize, go up, and the wind with it also. Then with the condenser, the water will condense and then separate here. With the, and then the rest of the wind will go back and uh, like emerge inside this core. So the toluene here will go and dissolve the organic matter, organic uh, material, uh, oil, I mean, and then go back to the bottom of the flux. So we repeat this process like for uh, several days until so we was changing the solvent from time to time until we find the solvent is clear. By collecting the water here, we can know the initial water volume inside the core and this solvent here, we can later on outside, we can evaporate the toluene and the rest will be oil. We can see how much oil we have here. Plus another technique to get the oil saturation in, or, or the oil volume initially in the core was by defining, finding the difference in the weight of the core before the test minus the dry core minus the extracted water here divided by the bore volume. We will we will come later to how to calculate the bore volume uh, in the next slides. After cleaning, we are ready to measure the properties. The first property that we want to measure is the porosity. Porosity is the fraction of the rock that is occupied by bores. So as you can see from this picture here, let's say this is uh, our rock. It has matrix, which is in this uh, red color. And the one is white, this is our bore space. So the bore space is a static, porosity is a static property. It can measure in the absence of flow. So there is no need for flow, fluid flow here in order to measure the porosity. And this one here, it represents or defines the storage capability of the formation for the fluid, especially in the conventional formation. So in conventional formation, in order, in, if you want to know how much oil or how much fluid inside the formation, it's important to know the uh, formation porosity. So you can see here, we have this bulk volume, assuming this is a, like, we have an, a serial dimension here. So this is a bulk volume. The red one is the matrix volume, and this is the bore volume. The porosity basically gonna be the bore volume divided by the bulk volume, which is bulk volume minus matrix volume divided by bulk volume. So in order to get the porosity, we have to measure two of this. Matrix with bulk, matrix with bore, with bore volume, or bore volume with bulk volume. So we'll go in details how to measure these uh, volumes. So the first one is the bulk volume. The easy one, if our core is, regular, is in regular shape, like cylindrical or cube, we can just measure the dimensions 
for it. So we can just calculate the uh, bulk volume for it. But what happens if the shape is not regular? So there is another method which is like based on Archimedes or uh, fluid displacement uh, technique. So with certain uh, graduated cylinder or container, we can get our core, our sample, we immerse it in the fluid and see how much the water will displace, how much the level will change. But very important step before this is we have to uh, coat the uh, rock sample with special, with a, like uh, with a wax, for example, in order to avoid the uh, avoid uh, like the, the water here to go inside the uh, the cores. So we can pre-saturate the core. So we saturate this core here with the same water that we will immerse on, or we can just coat the core with a certain uh, type of coating in order to avoid this water to go inside the cores. And then, so by the, knowing how much the level change on the on the gradual cylinder, or if this one here is completely full, and how, we can know how much water will displace out of the container. For matrix volume, so the matrix volume it's basically the grain of the uh, of the rock. How what, what is the volume for this grain? So if we know the density, if we know the density of the rock, of this grain, and we're able to dry the core completely, we can just divide the weight of the core, of, of the dried core divided by the density, and this is basically the volume. But sometimes we don't have the density, or in order to do the density, we need to know the volume, the matrix volume. So there is another method, we, which is also based on the Archimedes or uh, displacement uh, method. We have here a pycnometer, this simple tool he here. It's similar to the containers that I showed you in the last uh, uh, slide. So basically we fill this one here with a certain amount of water. So this here tube here is very thin, it's like a capillary tube. So we fill this one here and the level we can see it. We can fill it to the top here. And then we can, we, we have to crush the sample. So in order to take the bores out, and then we bought this crushed sample here. By knowing how much water displaced, this is basically the, uh, the matrix or the grain volume. Another good parameter that we can get from here is measuring the weight of this pycnometer with the fluid inside before and after the experiment. So if we know that the weight of this one here with the fluid on it, and then we add the fluid, and then we add the matrix or the grain on it, and then measure this one, the weight of this one here, and then the, uh, get the difference between the weight of the grain with the pycnometer minus the pycnometer weight, and then we divide it by the displaced fluid volume. This is basically the grain density. And we will use this one here later on uh, in order to uh, get many, uh, many parameters. The third volume is the bore volume. So there is a different technique to, to get the bore volume, to estimate the bore volume. I, I will show here uh, the basic two. One is the saturation method. For the saturation method, we will have a dry core. We will dry it and then another way another uh, and then after we dry the core we saturate the core with a certain fluid we know this fluid we know this density let's say a brine or a water and then we get the weight difference between the core which is in saturated case minus the core in the dry case divided by the fluid density this is basically the bore volume so so what's the difference here so our core in this case here it's it's basically matrix plus water and the water is in the bore and here the core is basically the matrix and the bore is filled with air we can neglect the air uh, weight so the difference between is how much water inside the bores divided by the density this is basically the bore volume another technique is the gas expansion gas expansion method 
it's based on Boyle's law. So we have, so this is like this picture here as an actual uh, prosometer. So this tool here called prosometer. So it based on, we have two cell or two chambers. This one here, we call it the reference cell. And this one here is the sample cell. The reference cell is connected to a gas source, let's say nitrogen or helium. And there is a pressure gauge here that can measure the pressure inside the, uh, the system. There is a valve between the sample cell and the reference cell. So what, how to do the experiment? First, we evacuate. We have like a vacuum bomb in order to take any air inside the system. Plug the core here, our core, our dry core here inside the, the cell, inside the sample cell. This valve here is closed. Then we put a pressure here, inject gas here in this reference cell with a certain pressure let's say B1, and then we open this valve. When we open this valve, the pressure here will expand, the gas here will expand in order to fill the available volume for, for, for it here. This volume here, it's basically the cell volume minus the matrix volume of the core. So based on Bell's law, B1, B1 equal to B2, V2, Assuming ideal gas, we can neglect the, the, the Z factor if the pressure we are using here is low. But if we are conducting this experiment at high pressure, we, can, we have to use a, a gas compressibility here. So we're going to be B1, B1 divided by Z1 equal to B2, V2 divided by Z2 if we are using high pressure conditions. So now the only unknown, we have the initial pressure. We have the initial volume. The initial volume is basically the reference cell volume equal to B2. B2 is the pressure after the gas expands multiplied by V2. So this V2 is going to be the reference cell plus the sample cell minus the matrix volume. So the only unknown here is going to be the matrix volume. Once we know the matrix volume, the bore volume equal to bulk minus matrix. Then we can use, so once we know one of these two, uh, once we know two of these three volumes, we can estimate the uh, porosity. Another technique that uh, many people start to use to know the uh, porosity is the CT scan, computed topography. So it's basically, it's uh, similar to, uh, it is a medical X-ray machine that uh, we, uh, all the hospitals are using. So instead of scanning human body, we are scanning our cores. So in this one here, it's basically uh, X-ray transmitted around the core, and then the intensity of the uh, of the X-ray is recorded using different detectors. This uh, recorded data converted to a city number. The city number is uh, related, or the change on it is related to the uh, grain density or the density of the material. How to do the measurement? We basically scan the core in a dry condition. So we dry the core, we put it here, we scan it. We get a city number for the core as a dry condition. And then we saturate the, saturate the core with a certain fluid, let's say water, and then scan it again. The difference between the two city scan values will be basically the difference, uh, uh, the difference in the material inside the board, which Initially, it was air, and after saturation, it basically is a brine. So the porosity can be estimated from using this equation here, CT scan of the core in saturated case minus CT scan of the core in a dry case, divided by the difference in the CT number between the brine and the air. The importance of this technique is we can get the porosity not just for the whole core, we can get it along the core. We can get it like along the core from the inlet to the outlet. The process is not constant value along the core. We can see how heterogeneous the, the core is. So this chart here show like city number versus the distance from the core inlet. So it's like basically an average city number for a slice and then another slice, 
slice slice from the inlet to the outlet. Using these two numbers, the city number for the saturated one and the city number for the dry one, we can get the brust using the previous equation, knowing the city number for the air and the water. So the medical CT scan, it was said that the city number for the air is minus 1000 and the city number for the DI or the deionized water, distilled water at zero. With adding brine or adding salt to the water, this city number will increase. So you can see here, so this image here, it is basically the city number for the core. The red one should be high porous media, the white one or the yellow one, it's high density material. It could be some uh, hydrate, some uh, uh, different clay with high density comparing to the quartz. So we said all this experiment we needed to dry and saturate the core. So how to do that? So for drying, we basically we can use uh, an oven to dry the core for, uh, for uh, at 60 to 80 degrees Celsius for 48 hours. We monitor the weight with time. We see like we put the core for uh, a day, then we take it out, measure the weight, compare it with the initial weight, and then put it back in the oven another day, and then measure the weight, see how the change in the weight of the core. If there is no change in the core after some time, now the core is dry, we can use it in our experiment. Very important point here, in case of shale cores, shale uh, and coal cores, uh, the cores should be dried under nitrogen atmospheric, uh, under uh, nitrogen atmosphere. So the shale, it has clay, coal, it has organic material that can be oxidized <clears throat> in presence of oxygen at high temperature. And this is, uh, process is, is irreversible. So once you oxidize the core, you will change the weightability performance, it will change a lot of properties for this course. For the clay, for the, uh, for the coal, you can induce <clears throat> due to this, uh, uh, oxidization, we can affect the absorption isotherm of the gas on it. So it's important to use the nitrogen or uh, atmosphere during heating the, the, this core. So basically we will put the shale or the coal cores inside the cell. This cell is filled with nitrogen and then we put this cell inside the core. We have to make sure that we have like a relief valve or something on this cell due to like with heating the gas or the nitrogen inside it will expand so we need to have like a relief valve in order to take out any extra pressure for the saturation method it's basically uh, the most common one is based on, on imbibition so the sample bought the core sample will put the sample on uh, accumulator and this accumulator we bought it has a brine it has a di water the deionized water and then we connect it to a vacuum. So this vacuum sucks the air out of, uh, out of, the, uh, out of the accumulator. And this allows the uh, brine or the DI water to, uh, to embed inside the uh, core pores. Uh, another technique we can just displace. We can put the core inside the core flood. I'll show you later how to do that. And then inject the brine and the deionized water inside the core. But the saturation for this case will not be sure 100% that it's fully saturated. Maybe there is some air there due to relative permeability, it wasn't able to go uh, for the water to go in and so on. So the vacuum, uh, the saturation under vacuum, one of the common technique to saturate the core with the brine. Another idea, another uh, good uh, important point here is the <coughs> saturating fluid. So as you know, sandstone, it has uh, clays. This clay is sensitive to the uh, brine concentration, sensitive to the water. So if we used for carbonate, for example, you can saturate your core if it doesn't have any clay. You can saturate your core with the ionized water. It doesn't matter. It will not affect the performance. It will not affect your cores. But if you have sandstone cores, 
if you have shale formation, it's important to saturate the score or whatever fluid, whatever fluid you are injecting in this one here, it should have a certain, uh, it should have a certain limit of salt on it in order to avoid clay swelling, in order to stabilize the clay inside this formation. Usually 5.8% percent KCL or NaCl is enough to stabilize the clay in the uh, formation and avoid the swelling. Sometimes if you want to go up, you can go, but it, this will affect the performance, uh, like the, affect the, like your viscosity of the fluid, you will go and uh, you will need to do different calculations in order to get this viscosity for the uh, permeability. You need to get the tenacity for the fluid in order for, uh, for uh, porosity measurement. So usually five weight percent is it's, it's enough for stabilizing the clay. So brusty, as a barometer, as I said before, it's important as it's defined the capability of a reservoir for to storing the fluid, which is basically our in place. So in case of gas reservoir, this equation here shows the gas in place. This function of the bulk volume of our reservoir, this is the area, the H is the second of, of the formation, multiplied by the brosity. Multiplied by one minus connect water saturation will come later to this parameter here divided by uh, gas uh, compressibility factor, formation and volume factor. So this is like uh, how, like define how the expansion of the change in the volume of the gas from the reservoir condition to the surface condition. But what I mean here, the velocity here is important parameter in order to know the in place. In case of oil, same equation, but here just the oil, uh, the oil uh, formation volume factor. And this one here, different constant because here this, uh, the result of this one here will gonna be in uh, standard cubic feet. This one here is gonna be in stock tank barrel. So the difference in this constant, it basically is a conversion between barrel and uh, standard cubic feet. So is this usually the case for all the reservoir? No. In unconventional reservoir, the gas can be stored in a different way. So unconventional reservoirs such as shale or coal, it is usually a dual porosity system. Dual porosity system, we have more than one porosity. It's not just metrics and uh, bores anymore. It is dual porosity system. So we have a natural fracture system here, here. And inside the matrix itself, we have bores, very, very, very small bores. So we call it dual porosity system. So how the gas is stored here? In this case, the gas will be stored as a free gas inside the natural fracture system and as adsorbed gas on the matrix system. For example, the adsorbed gas in place in the coal can be up to 90% of the gas in place. So you can see how much the adsorption is important here. So this will take us to the second property, which is the adsorption isotherm. Adsorption isotherm is the capability of it is uh, a relation. It's it's capability of uh, or how much gas can be absorbed on the rock surface at a certain temperature as a function of pressure. This is the adsorption isotherm. The common uh, equation that uh, have been used for to describe the adsorption isotherm is Langmuir equation. It's a function between, it's a relation between the gas content, the absorbed gas volume uh, in the standard cubic feet per ton of the uh, bulk system versus the pressure. So at certain pressure, you can get the absorbed volume. And this is the equation for, that describes the Langmuir absorption. Here there is many assumptions. One of it, one of the important assumption is assuming it's mono uh, absorption layer. So that mean on the matrix, for each spot, there is only one molecule of the gas will absorb on it. And this is not usually the case. There is different, uh, uh, different equation, different behavior, but this is, uh, will be outside uh, of the scope of this presentation for today. So I'll focus on the Langmuir absorption. So Langmuir absorption, the absorbed volume equal to VL Langmuir volume, Langmuir absorption volume multiplied by the system pressure divided by Langmuir pressure plus the pressure. 
So the BL is the maximum absorption. BL is the pressure at half of the BL of BL. So let's say at the the VL is the maximum. So this curve, as you can see here, will go to a stability. So this will be our maximum VL. Half of it will go here, and this is going to be our BL. So this two two parameters here, it's important. We can estimate it from the experiment, and then we fit it with the equation in order to get the adsorption at any pressure. So this curve here, as I said, it's at certain temperature. At certain condition, it can be changed with the changing the gas, with the changing the temperature. So there is a different method in order to get the absorption isotherm, <clears throat> all just to get how much how much gas absorbed to the gas uh, to the rock surface. Like there is a volumetric method, gravimetric method, all has the same uh, output at the end. One of this method I'll just describe here, just to know how to feel <coughs> the calculation, is the monometric method. Monometric method is something similar to the uh, bursometer. It's how we have the reference cell, we have a simple cell, and then we have in this reference cell, we, there is a valve between pressure gauge to measure, to measure the pressure on the system, and we have source for the gas. So at the beginning, we put a sample here. Usually in the absorption isotherm measurement, a big core mean like core crushed to a certain size, certain green size, and then we use this uh, powder in order to bag a core here. Why we do that? In order to control the surface area. So the surface area is one of the important uh, parameters in the absorption isotherm. Surface area mean like the area of the matrix. So once we know the green size, we know like the spherical uh, particle, we can calculate easily the, the, the area of it and then multiply by uh, uh, the, the volume or the grain uh, weight. Uh, multiply this volume by the how many grain, we can get this one here by knowing the weight and the, and the density. So we usually use powder in the sample cell. The process to do that we initially start by injecting the, our gas here, CO2, uh, methane, whatever our gas, we put it here in the reference cell, we know our pressure, and then we open our valve here. Once we open this valve, we're gonna, the gas here will expand to fill the boards inside the cell. If it's conventional reservoir like sandstone, the absorption can be neglected. Can be we can neglect the, the, the absorption here in case of sand. The expansion once we expand, the pressure here will stabilize and there is no change in the pressure. But here, in case of shale, in case of coal, the absorption capability of it for for the gas is high due to presence of organic materials. Once the gas absorb change from the free gas from the uh, from gas phase to an absorbed phase. It's something close to a solid phase, so the volume would be low, the pressure here will continue decreasing. We will record the decreasing <clears throat> decreasing in this uh, in the pressure. And by knowing at the end, once it's supplied, that means we reach to the maximum absorption capability. So we have the uh, stabilization pressure. Once we know this stabilization pressure, we can calculate how much free volume, how much free volume of gas, we minus or the total initial gas minus how much free now the rest is absorbed gas. We repeat this one at different pressure in order to create our curve. So this is one of the example for the pressure stabilization technique. <clears throat> Initially, we have our reference pressure here. And then once we open it, it's a grain. It's a, it is like back the core, so the process and the bit is, should be high. Once we open it, the gas expand, and the pressure will go to this point. After this, due to adsorption, we'll get, the gas will continue 
the pressure will continue decreasing until RC2 stabilized pressure. <clears throat> so number of molecule from uh, ideal gas equation or real gas equation BV equal to ZNRT, we can know how much, how, what is, how the number of modes for the gas here by knowing the pressure. We know the volume, which is the reference. We know the Z factor based at the pressure and the temperature. And then at the stabilized condition, we calculate the number of free moles here. The absorbed a number of moles is a function of the difference between the number of initial gas moles minus the uh, free gas mole at the end of the experiment. So this one here at certain pressure at the mean pressure. We repeat this one here at different pressure in order to get our point here with different pressure. Then we fit it with one of the techniques, one of the equation to describe the absorption of the serum, like Langmuir equation, in order to get the VL and BL. Once we get this one here, we can expand our data in order to get a different pressure. We can repeat this one here based, uh, with different condition like uh, dry, uh, using brine or whatever. <clears throat> the second or the third uh, uh, properties that we are gonna talk about is the permeability measurement. So the permeability is a property of the porous media and it's measures the capacity of the flow of the rock to transmit fluid. It's measures the fluid flow ability. It measures the ability of the rock for the fluid to flow. So let's say, let's describe it similar to the uh, uh, resistance. Like if you have electric, uh, you have a volt here difference, and then you have <clears throat> electric current, it will go from high voltage to low voltage. But if we have a resistance here, this will, like it resists this current to go from here to here. So it's something similar to that. So the permeability is one over the resistance, basically. So we have our current, which is the flow rate. We have our the uh, voltage difference here, which is our the pressure difference, which is our driving force. <clears throat> and the resistance is uh, our cores here, which uh, the the and the tortoise inside the the core. So Darcy described the uh, flow, as you see here, it's a function of the core permeability. It's proportional to the cross-section area of the core, as a, it's similar to, exactly similar to the resistance. If uh, the area, cross-section area increased here, that means the flow rate will increase. Divided by the fluid viscosity, the high viscous fluid, that means the flow here will be low for a certain uh, like pressure gradient, pressure other, uh, other parameter constant. And this one here is the pressure gradient is the driving force. <clears throat> Delta B is the pressure difference between the inlet and the outlet. And the L is the core length. So this one here, uh, we can get it's at Darcy, uh, Darcy uh, units. With using this unit here, like milli Darcy inch, uh, inches square inch and uh, flow rate at, cent uh, at milliliter per minute and this cost in centibars pressure in BSI, this would be our constant here in order to get the permeability. So, <clears throat> so this website here, this link here to the website, it's a good website we can use to calculate uh, your tool uh, to calculate the permeability if you have this parameters here, regardless, uh, your unit. It's a very useful, uh, very useful website if you want to use for a quick calculation for the permeability. If you don't want to go through the uh, uh, like convert, converting the units of the uh, your parameters. <clears throat> so now we'll go to the measurement. So. Under steady state condition, we measure the, 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 the permeability using a saturated core. So our core should be saturated first using the technique I said before, using the impipation method under vacuum. And it's important to do it under ambient temperature. 
at high temperature, we cannot control some parameters like the change in the uh, bore structure, the change in the fluid viscosity. So we're not able to control it. But at ambient temperature, the only parameter that we want to know is the permeability. So it's important to do this experiment at ambient temperature. So this picture here show as the actual core flood uh, setup. This is what we usually use for the permeability measurement and different core flood experiment like for any injection or evaluation process for uh, include uh, core analysis at high pressure and uh, high pressure, uh, low temperature or, or high temperature also. So this is schematic to describe it. It basically consists of high pressure, high temperature uh, core holder. And then we insert our core inside it. There is a rubber sleeve here around the core. This rubber sleeve or the core holder is it's connected to a hand bomb. This hand bomb it used to, to inject oil from here to the core. So it will like control the core and avoid flow around the core and force the flow only to be inside the core and also to mimic somehow the overburden pressure for the actual uh, formation. And this core here is connected through line to an accumulators. In this accumulator, we can put our brine or deionized water or our fluid. We have a bump, positive displacement bump that we can use to bump this fluid from the accumulator inside the core at certain flow rate. So the flow will come from the accumulator, go to the core inlet, come from the outlet, and then go to something called we call back pressure regulator here. This here to control just to control the flow at the end. We have a pressure transducer here to measure the pressure difference between the inlet and the outlet. And this pressure transducer is connected to a computer to record uh, the pressure data, usually we use a software called LabVIEW to record the pressure versus time. So, as I said, this one here should be at ambient temperature during the permeability measurement. Our core here should be saturated, fully saturated with uh, the fluid that I can inject with. I will inject at constant flow rate, measure the pressure difference with time until stabilization. This back pressure here, as I said, is controls the outflow. Like if you want to, uh, like if you want, let's say something like this. Here is our reservoir pressure and this one here, our bottom hole pressure. Just to control how much water, how much uh, production you want to get. It's important to use back pressure here during the uh, permeability measurement. Why? It's, if your core here is not fully saturated, there is some uh, areas not saturated, using this one here, it will force the pressure here to increase and this will increase the uh, possibility of 100% saturated core. So how to do the measurement? As I said, we inject the fluid at certain flow rate, we measure the pressure difference, and wait until a stabilization. So we do this one once, no, we do it at different flow rate. We do it at different flow rate, measure the stabilized pressure uh, at, at each rate, and then we plot the stabilized pressure versus the flow rate that I used, and then we use Darcy equation in this form here. So basically this is our Darcy equation, I have Q over delta B or delta B over Q, which is our slope from the curve. And then we use this one here to calculate the permeability. Why we usually do that? As I said before, the pressure transducer here is something similar to the uh, voltmeter. You can see it like that. So transfer a volt from here to the PC, the lab view will convert this volt <coughs> to the pressure. Sometimes we need to do calibration for the uh, for the pressure transducer here. 
and sometimes there is an error in this calibration. In order to avoid any error in the pressure measurement, if you did this here, you will able to exclude this error. So basically in, our, in this experiment here, the error is this value here. If the pressure transducer is, is fully calibrated and there is no other uh, errors with the pressure measurement, this one here should be uh, intercepted at zero, zero. At zero rate, the pressure, st uh, pressure stabilized should be zero. But here it's at 1.6, that means the error in the calibration is 1.6 psi. But this will not affect our measurement, but because what's important for us is the slope here, which is the delta B over Q. We use this one here to measure the permeability. So this one here, we call it the absolute permeability for water. So what if we used gas? So the difference between gas flow and the water flow is the slippage effect, especially if we inject the gas at low pressure. So based on Darcy experiments, the Darcy flow at the flow here at the, uh, at the boundary should be zero. The velocity of the fluid here should be zero. And the flow will be this shape here. For the gas, it will not, it is not, it's, it has not, it doesn't have this behavior. At the boundary of the bores or the surf at the surface, the gas will slip on the uh, rock surface. So the velocity here is not zero, which is the non darcy flow. So we have to correct for this one here. Klingenberg developed a method to correct for this methodology, especially as I said, if we used the gas at low pressure. So we run the measurement at different pressure. We plot the permeability versus the uh, mean pressure. And then we extend this line here until, uh, sorry, we plot here versus one over B. So at the infinity, where the molecule of the gas is very close together, will behave like liquid. So this is at infinity. So by extending this one here to uh, zero, which is one over infinity, this will give us our uh, true permeability. So the Klingenberg effect will be different based on our, the type of fluid that, or type of gas that we are using. So the difference between this one here is the nuclear, nuclear size of the, uh, of the gas. So hydrogen has smaller molecular size comparing to the carbon dioxide. <clears throat> As a result, the Klingenberg effect for hydrogen would be much more higher comparing to carbon dioxide, and so on. So this, as I said, this technique here using the cold flood, this is for a steady state condition. We use it for a conventional reservoir, high permeability reservoir. <clears throat> we inject our fluid at certain flow rate. We wait until stabilization. What if our formation is very tight, like shale formation, for example? And if you inject, like for example, at one cc per minute or 0.5 cc per minute, it will take for it will take days in order to get a stabilization, which is a steady state condition. So there is another technique in order to measure the permeability for unsteady state formation for uh, uh, tight and shale formation. So this technique here called the pulse decay method. It's a simple one based on transient flow. So we will not reach the steady state condition. So we have our core holder here. <clears throat> we insert our core inside. We add, we add the overburden pressure using the hand bump. So to prevent the flow around the core and force it to be just inside the core. We connect this core from the inlet and from the outlet to two volume up, uh, down volume, downstream volume, and upstream volume. And then we, we have a back, we have a pressure transducer here. We have a gas source to, uh, to, to one of the volumes. This one here should be up, or the gas volume should be here. And then we open the valve between the up and the down volume. So the gas here will expand through the core and flow through the core to fill the other one. 
until stabilization. The good thing here, we don't need to wait until stabilization because the trend for it will be, it will following like a linear, uh, it will follow a log, uh, log trend. So once we establish this trend, we, there is no need for stabilization. This chart here shows the difference between the upstream and the downstream volume once we open it. You can see here, we start the upstream at certain pressure and the downstream is zero. There is no gas here. Upstream, it has a pressure gas, let's say at uh, 550, for example, BSI. And then once we open this valve here, the gas will expand to fill the bores here. It's something similar to the brosimeter measurement. We can use this here, this step, small step here, to get the uh, porosity. And then once we open this valve here, the gas will expand from this side in order to fill the downstream volume and flowing through the, uh, flowing through the, the core and the downstream pressure will start to go up. So the difference here will follow a log trend and this is trend here is a function of the permeability of the core. Jones in 1997 derived this equation here from based on the transit, uh, transit flow. And you can see here, this is len delta B. Delta B is the difference between the inlet and the outlet versus the time in second. It's a straight line here. And the slope here is a function of the permeability or the permeability is a function of the slope here. So this is the equation here. This is our slope, ln delta B by time. Z, this is the gas compressibility, comp uh, gas viscosity in centipoise. This is the core length. This is the cross section area. This is the mean pressure between the up and the downstream, the uh, average pressure. And this is the two volume, in the up volume and the down volume. So this technique here is very is quick. And very helpful, especially in case of very tight uh, sand or shale formation, we can get an estimate, accurate estimate for the uh, core permeability without having to wait for the steady state uh, condition. So, so the permeability that we measure, we just measure, so we call it absolute permeability. There is no other fluid inside the rock. So this is static also, it is a, it was a, it is a static property for the core. It's not a static, it is rock property. So it's based on the rock. So what if we have another fluid inside our core? It's not just water or it's not just gas. If we have another more than one phase, we have oil or gas or water inside the, our core. We're going to have we introduce another parameters, which is the relative permeability. Relative permeability is the ability of the porous media to conduct the fluid when it is its saturation is less than 100% of the pores. So the pores, it, uh, it, it's not just water inside it. No, there is water and there is another phase like gas or oil or, or something. So the relative permeability, basically, it is the effective permeability divided by the absolute permeability. So in case of oil, relative permeability to oil, it is the effective oil permeability divided by the uh, absolute permeability, relative permeability to water, the same and same for gas. Usually this is the shape of the relative permeability curve. So it has like, uh, usually it's blocked against the wetting phase, which is the uh, water saturation. With increasing the water saturation here, the more water inside the bores, the high permeability for water will be and less for oil or for the other gas, I mean. This point here, we call it reducible water at which the water start to move. And this point here, we call it irreducible or residual oil saturation. At this point here, we're not able to move this oil. We are not able to produce it at the current condition. So there is different technique to measure the relative permeability. There is a steady state technique and, and unsteady state condition technique. So for the steady state condition, this one here, 
it's good in order to know the relative permeability for the formation, but it took long time in order to establish the statistic condition. So basically, we start with high, with 100% saturated core, and then we inject oil and water simultaneously at different ratio in order to establish a different saturation here, and we injected this one here until we have a steady condition, steady state condition. Mean the, uh, the volume of oil coming out, same as the volume of oil injected. The, so the volume of water coming out is same as the volume of water injected. And we're using the material balance, the mass balance, by between how what injected, what come out. We can know how much inside, which is the saturation, basically. Then using the flow rate here, the, the rate for each oil and gas, and we have the pressure drop across the core. We basically use the Darcy equation in order to get the effective permeability. Divide the effective permeability by the uh, uh, by the absolute permeability in case of 100%, and this is the relative permeability. But as I said, it takes long time in order to do this one here. Instead, we have the unsteady state method. Unsteady state, we don't have to inject two fluid. We inject only one fluid. We don't have to wait till stabilization or the steady state condition. But we use technique called buckley levert equation for the displacement in order to calculate the relative permeability. So we start with 100% water saturation, and then we start to inject oil until we reach the critical, uh, the irreducible water saturation. We measure the effective oil saturation at this point. And then we start our water injection just to mimicking the water flooding process. With injecting the water here, the water saturation will start to increase, start to produce oil. At certain time, we will break through. Here we are start to produce water here. And then at the end, no oil is coming out, which is the residual oil saturation. I'll not go in details on the calculation for this one here. Just I want to show how to, to do it. Like we use a, a fractional flow curve in order to estimate fractional flow curve and the uh, saturation estimation, and the, this is the injectivity index. J this here, just to show like the calculation, it's based on the fractional flow curve or the buckley levert But it is still uh, valid and very uh, readable technique in order to get the relative permeability for uh, different fluid in a rock, uh, in a core rock. <clears throat> so, as I said, this is our the shape, the regular shape for the uh, relative permeability. But this one here will be different based on the weightability. Weightability is the tendency of certain fluid to spread or adhere to the solid surface in the presence of other fluid. Immissible fluid should be in miscible condition. So these two fluids, water and oil, will not be miscible together. So for strongly water weight, that means uh, the rock love to, to, to like, the, like the water more than the oil, so the water will adhere to the rock surface comparing to the oil, so it will be difficult to move the water. That's why you see here, the rate of weight of the water is very low even with increasing the water saturation. In this case here, this one here will be, move will be high. For the oil saturation, for the oil rate of permeability, the rate of permeability to it will be high, and the residual oil will be low because it it's easier to move the oil. For strongly oil wet, it will be as uh, the different. Here, the residual oil saturation is high. It's difficult to move the oil. With injecting water, it's difficult to move the oil. So the rate of permeability to the water will be high, the residual oil saturation will move to the left. That means we will lift more oil inside the reservoir. <clears throat> How to measure the, the weightability? Usually, there is different technique to measure the weightability, the weightability amount cell, contact angle. Uh, here, this here is a contact angle. It's basically, this is our rock surface, and then surrounded by oil. We put a droplet of water above it. Based on the shape of the droplet, we can judge if this core is, uh, if this rock is oil wet or rock uh, or uh, or oil wet. So, 
if the contact angle is less than 90, we can say this is a water wet. Usually the contact angle measures through the denser phase, which is the water. So if it's less, less than, less than 90, this means the water will spread on the rock surface. This means the rock here love the water more than the oil. So it's water wet rock. If it's the, if the uh, contact angle is more than 90, that means the rock here does not like the water, and so it will be oil wet. Young's equation describes the contact angle as a function of the interfacial tension between the oil and the solid, water and the solid, and the interfacial tension between the two fluids. So as I said before, in case of water weight reservoir, the water will spread on the rock surface. The contact angle will be less. And from Young's equation, we can say that the interfacial tension between the water and solid is higher than the interfacial tension between the oil and solid. Or another, we can say the adhesion tension is negative. Adhesion, adhesion tension is this difference here the oil solid interfacial tension minus the water solid interfacial tension. So this, we call it the adhesion force. So in this case, this is water wet <clears throat> rock. If it's oil wet reservoir, it will be uh, different. So the oil, the contact angle here is higher than 90. The oil surface, oil, oil solid interfacial tension is higher than the water solid interfacial tension. The adhesion tension is positive, and contact angle, as I said, is higher than 90. So, how does this affect our, our reservoir? So, in case of water weight, so in case of water weight, the water will fill the small bores. And it will be surround. Uh, it will be around the core. The core, the the grain will be surrounded by water. This means it will be easier for the oil, which will be will fill the bigger bores. It will be easier for the oil to be displaced in case of water flooding, for example. In oil wet, the oil will fill the small bores, and the oil will stick to the rock surface. So it will be difficult to move it. So the residual oil saturation here will be high. So the contact angle, we have different technique to measure the contact angle. We have sisal drop and cavitative bubble techniques. For the sisal drop, we have a droplet from the, from the top. We have the rock surface surrounded by the main fluid. And then we have a droplet from the top. So this one here, we usually use it to represent if we are injecting higher density fluid to a rock that is already filled with lower density fluid, same as uh, water flooding, for example. So we are injecting water, which is our droplet here, to a rock is already filled with oil, which is low density fluid. Cavity bubble technique, if we are injecting lower density fluid to the uh, rock that is filled by higher density fluid. Like by, for gas injection, for example, if we are injecting gas in our, uh, our uh, formation, so it will be our rock here and surrounded by the main fluid, the original fluid, and then we give, we put a bubble of the gas here. Once this one here is placed on the rock surface, we take an image for it and we measure the contact angle in the denser fluid. We measure the contact angle with a technique with a setup called drop shape analysis. So it basically it consists of high pressure, high temperature cell with a sample holder here. And then we fill this one with our main fluid. In case of like gas injection, it's gonna be brine. Then supply is the condition of the formation, like pressure or temperature, like inject with the bomb until we reach the, the pressure that we want, heat the cell in order to reach the temperature that we want. Then we inject our injecting fluid, displacing fluid, which is the gas here, for example. So the bubble will go up and place on the rock surface. Then we take image for this bubble on the rock surface. And then with a certain software, MATLAB or 
uh, image A, we can get easily the this angle here, which represent the contact angle. So this is like end of my presentation. I didn't want to go. There is different other parameters like capillary pressure. There is other problems like saturation. I didn't went through it like for the sake of time. To summarize, core preparation is essential process stage before appropriate measurement. We have to know the drying process. We have to know which fluid we want. We have to use for saturation and which technique we use to clean, like in Dean Stark or other. Brosity is a static property that defines the storage capability uh, in conventional reservoir, but in unconventional reservoir with the dual process system, we need to add the absorption. Absolute permeability, it's a rock property that defines the flow capability of the rock. When the rock is 100% saturated by the fluid, the relative permeability and the rock weightability can be used to predict the multi-phase flow inside the reservoir. So this is the end of my presentation. Thank you all. And I will be happy to answer any question. But before this, uh, I want to like say something. Uh, as uh, Reem said before, I, I got my PhD from Texas and m My supervisor was Dr. Nasruddin. So I want to take this chance to thank him for like all his knowledge that he gave to me all the support so i most of this work most of my experience in the experimental uh, in lab experiments was done under his supervision so i want to thank him and uh, he passed away like two days ago so uh, we want to pray for him and uh, ask allah to forgive him and accept it from him thank you all Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ahmed, and thank you for the last note. Uh, we actually all learned a lot from uh, Dr. Nasruddin, and uh, this is why we're renaming our academy after him. Uh, we ask everyone from the attendees, each in his way, to pray for him and send him uh, good prayers. Uh, Thank you also for a great presentation, uh, even for a wireline engineer like me who logged the uh, coring in HRS City. I learned a lot about uh, this product. I, uh, I didn't know a lot of information uh, and uh, the depth of uh, the importance of the coring uh, that you, sir, explained. So now moving to the questions, uh, there is a question that uh, many uh, attendees ask about the difference between absorption and adsorption in case of the core sampling. So absorption and adsorption. Adsorption is gonna be on the surface, so it will not go inside the on si inside it. So adsorption, this will be absorb to the rock surface. It will not go inside, but absorb it will go inside the matrix. This is the main difference between adsorption and absorption. Thank you, doctor. Um, another question that, um, hmm, how to perform formation evaluation by matching logging, coring, and well testing measurement for porosity, permeability, and saturation? And which is the accurate measurement for porosity and permeability, coring or logging? So usually why we are doing coring, if we have actual core, we usually use this course to calibrate our well logs. So this is basically, so we have the well logs for all the well, we have rock sample, not for all the well, we use this rock sample to calibrate our well logs, especially for the porosity and the permeability. So, if we have, if we retrieve the core sample, to the best of my knowledge, to if we retrieve this core sample in an accurate way, the calculation or the measurement for the bro sample, for example, will be accurate. And that's why all the company are using it to calibrate the wall logs. Uh, I hope this answers your question, right? Is this a question? Yes, this is a question, exactly. Okay. Thank you, doctor. Uh, another question we had that, um was asked many times. Um, out, outcrop formations underwent some weathering and erosion. Can we do accurate analysis to them? And what 
type of analysis can we do? So out crop cores, it will, as you said, it will be affected to the weather. A lot of condition will change it, but we use it usually not to judge the formation to get like, we cannot compare the process permeability or for, for this formation comparing to the, uh, our formation rock, but we use it to do qualitative evaluation for a certain uh, experiments. Like if we want to use a certain acid system, if we don't have a, a actual rock sample, or we have a very uh, limited number of cores on the formation rock, we do our study in a core. We are trying, we try to go and get outcrop with somehow similar or close mineralogy, close permeability and porosity, close to the formation. We do our evaluation to select our best candidate from the fluid, and then we conduct the final experiment on the formation rock. So this, that's why we usually use, uh, how we usually use outcrop. It's basically to do qualitative measurement, nothing to judge, judge our formation. Okay, thank you, doctor. Another question, how to get side sidewall cores, drilling, rotating into the formation horizontally or pushing the bit like a bullet or is there another mechanism in which is better? So to the best of my knowledge also, the sidewalls basically uh, usually run on wire line. So it's, it's a vertical formation. So uh, in vertical well, so it's run in, uh, on wire line. And then Let's go here. So this is our wire line. This is our tool here. We'll go to the bottom of the, our, forma uh, our well. And then we want to know certain properties for certain formation. So it doesn't matter if it's, it's like. So our formation is horizontally like this at our well. So we use this tool at a certain location, at certain depths, we'll go with this is a small drill bit or it's like a gun. We get a small core and then we put it in this reservoir here. So it is vertically, we go it's in vertical well. Okay. And then for sharing your knowledge with us, um, we look forward for more collaborations and uh, we um, might have further questions, so maybe we can send them your way after uh, the webinar. Yes, I'll be happy to answer it. Thank you all. Thank you so Thank much. You're welcome.